Hi, class, and welcome back to uh, eSports. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at the start of the video game industry, and I'll actually walk you through what we're going to talk about, um, and we're going to kind of divide up the um, industry into three parts and kind of look at them separately. So let's go and do a nice recap. Okay, so after World War II, we have this huge technology boon, right? Um, the war is over. Uh, we defeated them Nazis, right? But what's occurring is you have all this technological buildup during the war, right? And now we don't have war anymore. So what do we do with it? Well, industry, of course, right? So um, they start to take these war machines and repurpose them and use them for research and uh, at universities and uh, large corporations. And what they're doing is basically showing off their wares through video games, right? You get the corporate bigwigs interested or the uh, university administrators or researchers, and you're showing them off how, um, you know, fast and how much computing power can happen. And they might not be, you know, super tech savvy. Um, so what you're doing is you're inviting them to play these video games. Most of them were dismantled and forgotten about. They're basically one-offs and they had little impact uh, because the, the thing was you weren't selling a video game. You were selling the computer processing power, right? Uh, if you have a computer that's $200,000 and it could play a video game, whoop de doo right? Um, but if it, you have a $200,000 machine and somehow we can do additional research or it can do some processing thing that would take 100 men, you know, 100 hours to do uh, every month, well, that's saving you money versus playing a video game. So they were only meant to showcase what uh, the machines, what the computers were capable of, and they weren't really meant to start an industry. Uh, they were often specific to the hardware themselves, so if you change the hardware, the game didn't work, right? Uh, and these were oftentimes, they were artisanal. They were artisanal computers, right? They were hand-built by engineers, and they're one-offs, right? They weren't like in a factory um, these were, uh, <laughs> if you want to think of them like heirloom computers, right? Like the heirloom tomato, um, hippies would have loved them, right? Just kidding. Um, and they got better as computers did. And remember, def definitions matter. What, how you define what a video game is, is going to dictate what was the first video game, for instance, what is and what is not a video game. So here's our kind of timeline. We move from TurboChamp and this uh, cathode ray tube entertainment device. Remember, because Turing is actually thinking about what computers would look like even before computers existed. So it's kind of fascinating kind of uh, thing. Can we have a game without a, com a video game without a computer? I don't think so, but maybe. And that leads us all the way to <clears throat> from the end of the 40s all the way to the beginning of the 70s when we get the release of Pong and uh, Magnavox Odyssey. Again, this isn't really in scale. Let's just kind of give you a look at what's going on uh, at the very beginning till we get to that start of a video game industry in the home council and at the arcade. Okay, so um, for the rest of this class, I'm going to kind of divide it up and kind of divide and conquer model, right? I can't talk about everything all at once because it gets confusing, right? So we're going to start out with video games, and then we're going to take a look at arcades, consoles, and PCs separately, right? And then we'll take a look at uh, the internet. So I'm covering each one of these um, as a separate industry, but know that there's flow. Right? There's things happening in arcades which are influencing consoles and vice versa. And what's happening with consoles is also kind of carrying over to PCs. And then we got um, you know, the internet in here. 
Um, and the internet's really only affecting consoles and PCs because honestly, by the time the internet came out, uh, it was too late for arcades, right? You have some, um, you know, connected arcade games uh, where, you know, oftentimes there's a touchpad, like uh, the 10 numbers you punch in your code and you can access uh, a character or usually a car uh, that you've been playing, that you've been building up by putting shoving quarters in this thing but really arcades um it's too late for them by the time the internet comes out that's not true for consoles and literally um it brings pc gaming into the forefront of uh esports uh thanks to the internet also another important things are the games themselves right um, we're not going to treat them as separate, but just realize the games that are appearing in all three of these are similar, but not always, right? PCs, in fact, I have a very different video game culture early on because they're not structured in the same way to produce really high quality graphics, right? They're meant to be almost like a Swiss army knife. You know, dad can do his spreadsheets, uh, mom can, you know, keep a cookbook and the kids can kind of play, uh, you know, this kind of makeshift video game like a mud or something like that. Uh, and they're not meant to be graphically intense. Um, I would say the games between arcades and consoles are more likely to um, interact much more than PCs, at least early on. Mobile gaming. Um, some of you may say, well, that's not real video games, professor, but honestly, that's a billion dollar industry right there. That's a lot of cash that you're ignoring um, because you don't think it's, you know, eSport, right? And there has, in fact, been attempts to create um, mobile eSports. I, I think of Vainglory that came out uh, hmm, had three, four years ago. It was semi-popular, it was basically an attempt to uh, create League of Legends, uh, but on a tablet or mobile system. I met one of the top players, really a nice kid. Uh, unfortunately, never came to our university for esports, but uh, it would have been cool. So mobile gaming, we'll touch on it a little bit, uh, but really comes much, much later after the scene is already created in esports. Okay, there we go. So... We got to start off with the arcades. Okay, something you need to realize, right, is I kind of touched on this a little bit before, but arcades had been around, right, um, long before video games were, and they existed in the form of pinballs. If you ever had a chance to go to a pinball arcade, it's a blast. It's a lot of fun, especially if it has some solidly well curated games. Uh, Adam Family's always a, bu uh, a big draw, and uh, even the Ghostbusters are fun. But they actually have some uh, pinball games that have like apps you can download now and interact with the game. It's it's it is an attempt, right, to bring in that internet feel. But I don't say it's going to pay off. But who knows? Um, <clears throat> you remember Pong was key, right? So uh, Atari in '72. Uh, it really hit its stride in 73. And what was happening is um, there was tons of copies and lawsuits and stuff like that. But pinball arcades weren't just like, oh my God, let's throw out all the pinball machines and just buy all the Pongs. Put in all the Pongs, right? No. They were adding video games um, to their lineup, right? They probably put them towards the front of the store, uh, because this is a newfangled thing. Uh, so it wasn't like, oh no, we now we have um, video games and we can't have pinball anymore. They coexisted for quite a long time. But in 74, <clears throat> so basically two short years later, the bottom falls out on pinball machines, right? Uh, why? Video games, right? Th that's what people want to play. People moved on. It's like Beanie Babies and fidget spinners, right? You, you can't find a fidget spinner anymore any, in a store, right? You go into Walmart, you're like, where's the fidget spinners? And the guy's like, fidget spinners? 
what are you from you know 2015 right so what happened is uh people moved on their taste they wanted a technological feel the the buzz the high intensity interaction versus like bloop there goes a bob you know the repetitive nature of pinball kind of did it in um <clears throat> And in fact, um, you see the pinball industry just fall apart. There's only really one maker of pinballs, uh, Stern Pinball in Chicago anymore. I, I think there's one or two very, very small competitors, but he's that's the big guy kind of consolidated uh, the whole industry. And there was race games and target shooters. Pretty bumpy ride, though. Um you know, through the, the 70s, it's really the industry is trying to figure out, right? So they're trying to figure out what is a good model for a video game to make it profitable, right? Um, now, nowadays, you're like um, high score, lives, intense play. But, you know, some of the early games use a timer. You have to play for three minutes and then they, boop, they booted you. A lot of the early games didn't keep a high score, right? You're just kind of playing there. Um, and it took a while to build these games that were easy to play, but hard to master. That's the key thing about a video game. You've got to be able to kind of jump into it, stop, start playing like any Joe Blow off the street. But then bada bing, bada boom, uh, you know, if you can get better and better and better and better uh, at it. Okay. This is the breakout moment for the industry, right? 78, Space Invaders. Uh, Taito and Midway, right, come out with, you know, some of the key factors that make a great video game. High score, right? Now you can compete not just against the game itself, uh, but any Joe Blow, you know, they're trying to get their top initials up on that scoreboard music right um it, they had it wasn't you know <laughs> an orchestra or anything like that but it was, doo, 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 doo. you know it had some intense gameplay that picked up uh when the guys got closer um it was um lives right play was regulated by lives remember i talked about you know do we you know charge them a quarter every three minutes but lives was a big part of that because as you get better and better, you save more money, right? So if you can stay on a quarter for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, right? You got to play a video game for 20 minutes on a quarter. That was a good deal, right? And these waves of attackers that would come down, right? Because you're defending the city, right? They would actually speed up as they came down because it was it was a bug in the system because there was less guys to process it processed what was left quicker right and allowed the guys to move down faster atari comes out with asteroids in 79 uh vector graphics um pretty awesome game one of my favorites actually i used to play it all the time as a kid in a laundromat uh, when my mom would be lo washing laundry, but uh, fast paced, a lot of quick action, reaction times were really important in this bad boy, and it was just a huge hit, right? And then by the end of the 70s, uh, video games had displaced pinball, right? People just stopped playing them. So if the pinball machine broke, the manager, well, you know, stick it in the back, you know. Or, you know, just hold on to it. We'll keep part. People stop buying them, right? Uh, that's why all of them went out of business. Because the kids wanted them video games. So here's kind of the key games of the 70s. Uh, it kind of gives you some timeline. Pac-Man was important. Don't forget Missile Command, Centipede. Uh, you know, um, Frogger was big. q -Bird, All kind of good classic Games came out um, basically in the late 70s uh, into the 80s, right? It was a stellar time to be playing video games because the industry figured it out, right? They knew what games would sell, what games wouldn't. It wasn't perfect, of course. 
The cabinets were pretty standardized. If you look at all those pictures, the cabinets look almost exactly alike. So they can pump them out quickly. Um, and yeah, people love these things. The councils, right? Uh, the councils couldn't keep up. Uh, we'll talk about more about the councils, but the graphics on these bad boys were head and shoulders above what you can play at home, right? So, oh yeah, you know, it's fun and, you know, you can play Pac-Man at home, but on the Atari, you know, Pac-Man was often referred to as Flicker Man because it was so bad, <laughs> To play, but you in 98 you go to arcade and you could bust out some Pac Man and look great. And the controls were awesome. Uh, you could sit down and play, you could stand up and play. It was good time. So, these are the key games uh, that make a huge impact in the late 70s. What also starts is uh, Chuck E. Cheese, right. Um, not, not the original name. If you know the original name of Chuck E. Cheese, post down below in the comments. Tell me. Tell me you're a smart kid and you know, right? But what happens is Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, wants to get into that sweet, sweet arcade money, right? He's selling a unit for five grand. That's solid money, right? But these arcade owners are making 20 grand off it. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want in, right? So what starts to happen is, you know, he puts together a team. They get your Chuck E. Cheese, the gross rat. Who doesn't want to worship a rat while you're eating pizza, right? And he was inspired by Disneyland. He wanted to kind of give that fun feel. He knew kids love pizza and video games. Um, so you start to get these Chuck E. Cheeses popping up. And they're hugely popular, right? Hugely popular. Aladdin's Castle. This is more on the, the West Coast uh, than anywhere by me. And these would pop in the malls and they were a chain arcade, right? And what starts to happen is malls become huge, right? They're a place where mom and dad can look at the latest fashions at Sears, right? Um, and the kids can go down and they can play in the arcade. And sometimes malls would have... You know, two arcades, one on each end. Who who doesn't want to, you know, walk the whole length of the mall to get there? You just, you know, stop at the one near you. And these pool halls were switching over to arcades. Pinballs were switching over arcades. And malls start to create a, really a big culture uh, around it. They have the, uh, the Mall Madness uh, board game for kids. Um, you know, all the kids in the on TV are going to the mall and hanging out. It was the place to be if you're a kid growing up in the 80s, right? Actually, that's one big beef I have about Ready Player One. It's like, oh, it's all about the 80s nostalgia. And it completely leaves out one of the biggest, you know, uh, zeitgeists in the whole entire 80s, the mall, right? So people are coming from all around, um, you know, they're playing video games, they're eating pizza, they're worshiping rats, um, it's a, just a crazy, crazy time uh, to be alive. And this is the golden age, man. There, people, the industry is raking in money hand over fist. You know, um, you're looking at a doubling in less than like two years of how much money the arcades are are raking in, almost a doubling, right? But there's trouble on the horizon. 1983, the bottom falls out. There's too many arcades, right? Um, owners are buying these machines on um, credit, right? So you're paying them off. Uh, you're trying to get the latest, greatest machines in so you could beat... The other arcade in town or the other arcade in town or the other right so depending on the size of your town you can have like four arcades two in the mall and two mom and pops right so the problem is there's a lot of competition they want the newest games and these games are not cheap the other thing um you know that starts to hit home is these machines are only money makers for a couple months right so uh, and then the bottom starts to fall out of those machines as the next one comes in to view. 
So now you're stuck with a $5,000 machine. You, you've had it on your floor for three months and people have switched over to whatever just came out, right? And now you need those. So there was actually um, somewhat, I wouldn't say a black market, but uh, some smart kids came out with a way to actually put mods into um, arcade cabinets to allow um, um, owners to kind of modify the games a little bit and add new levels or uh, different uh, styles of play to get extra money. So in, uh, you could have like Missile Command, right? Your standard, but you could put a mod in and have Super Missile Command or Mega Missile Command. There was a big lawsuit over this. Um, eventually the modders won. Um, so that's cool to know. So it's still at a dilemma. I kind of talked about this a little bit. You know, they need to have games that were easy to start but hard to master. It's still a dilemma that plagues the uh, industry today. I remember talking to some uh, gentleman from Blizzard during a, a conference, and I talked about the need uh, to make the games uh, more accessible and multi-platforms uh, so everyone can play. And they can all just jump in at once and you can play with your uh, kids and stuff like that. Because I, I, when I think about esports, I think about baseball, right? Apple pie, right? No, just baseball. Because baseball is super easy to have. All you need is a ball, right? You don't need a bat. You can get a branch in the forest, right? Or an old chunk of two by four. You don't need uh, bases, right? You just throw down your jackets first, second, third, right? And that's all you need. And you can just, you can spontaneously break out into a baseball game. And baseball was our pastime because it was so easy and cheap to play. Because we, you know, when it came really into popularity, uh, we were suffering from a depression. And we needed something to do uh, with our time that was cheap and easy, right? There's also a big fear about the arcades, right? They start to become hot spots for trouble. Kind of like the pool halls, right? And the pinball arcades. Well, now the, all the teenagers and the bad kids are out there, you know, shooting them up and chomping their ghosts and chewing their bubble gum, right? Causing all kinds of trouble, you know, and similar fears from the 1950s in pinball. I mean, our Surgeon General, right, uh, C. Everett Coop came out and said, children were becoming addicted to video games, body and soul, right? These video games were taking over their kid's soul. We had to save them, uh, right? So that kind of starts that all these kids are hanging out. Oh, what are they doing? Parents don't understand it, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the Surgeon General comes out and says, oh my gosh, these are so dangerous and and all this terrible stuff. So, you know, parents start to get a little weird, leery about dropping off little Johnny at the mall to play arcade games. And then, boom. Look, 1985. There's the crash. Uh, but it's kind of a stark reality, right? In two years, the industry is decimated. Like, decimated. The bottom falls out. Um We'll talk a little bit more about Atari and how uh, that were kind of that was issues too. But um, basically, you know, it's people oversold the arcade, right? They the um, owners had too many games that they couldn't pay for. Kids only wanted to play the latest and greatest. Parents were kind of leery about dropping off their kids, and it just hits this point where the the bottom kind of falls out of it. Because uh, people are like, oh, I don't know about this video. I got enough of it, right? I There's only so many quarters I want to blow on this stuff. Um, so, And one thing I want to kind of talk about, I think this is a good uh, kind of segue, right? Because what we're talking about, what I'm talking about is what are called third spaces, right? Um there's this Indian sociologist that looked at these post-colonial studies and he looked at how people who were colonized um, 
basically interacted with each other in the world. And he said there's the first space, right? The first space is your home, right? That It's where you live. The second space is kind of where you interact on a very formal level with others in society, right? So this is work, church, school, that kind of good stuff. If you're one of my college students listen, listening to this bad boy, you know, when we meet in the classroom, that's our second space. But the third space is carved out from the other two and it is separate and different. This is where we allow our hair down, right? We lose our ties, become less formal. You know, these are bars, clubs, the mall, playgrounds, arcades. Um, and what I kind of want you to kind of think about for a moment is this idea that you young folk have pretty much lost all your third spaces, right? Uh, there's some malls left, but very few, right? Uh, there's not really any arcades around. There's a couple, but they're all taken over by old guys like me, real living in the glory days. So there's no longer these third spaces uh, where kids can be a kid, right? <laughs> Um, a lot of, even Toys R Us, right? Even if you want to go goof around there, Chuck E. Cheese is going bankrupt. You do have playgrounds, which are good. Um, but I really argued that, you know, your generation, this younger generation is growing up without a way of interacting together. And, you know, I know it's not going to be around forever, but the pandemic is probably making it even worse. But. There's hope. I think what's occurring is there's a creation of a third space digitally, right? I think about my kids. They're all on Discord, right? Chatting away, you know, throwing up hilarious dad bots. My son's like, man, you got to see this bot. It's a dad bot. I'm like, what? Um, so you have video games that uh, are massive multiplayer video games. We'll talk more about those. But this is all of a sudden where you can get that together with your friends. You know, you can put on your headset. You can say a bunch of swear words that mom and dad would never let you say. Um, you can go out and shoot your friend in the head and loot his dead body, right? <laughs> um, but I argue that kids are starting to carve out a third space from these other two, from the digital interactions, right? They're carving out computers. They're carving out the internet. Um, and is this good? Is this bad? Uh, I just think parents need to realize in some sense that we've taken away and really diminished all the third spaces. Maybe not us specifically, but over the generations, they've kind of fall into the wayside uh, and when we were like get off a computer get off a computer you know what that is get out of the arcade get out of the arcade for when i was a, a kid get out of the mall get out of the mall right because that's where they're playing that's where they're interacting with their friends the last gasp of the arcade right so mid 80s into the 90s arcades are still common right you can still go to the mall you're still Probably only one now, right? The janky, uh, poorly run arcade was gone. But the good one stayed around. You start to get multi-game cabinets, right? So instead of just producing a Frogger machine, uh, now they put out a Midway or Bally video game. And you could take the board out and put in a new board. So um, it kind of makes it easier on um, establishment owners. They no longer have to, you know throw out a cabinet basically or relegate it to the back room they can pop it out uh, a board out reskin it right you would put the new um sticker over it and bada bing bada boom you got the latest greatest game plus you don't have to worry about all that shipping hassles all that kind of good stuff so that's awesome 91 street fighter 2 by capcom huge hugely successful over 60,000 cabinets sold. Um, really novel characters. Uh, solid hand-to-hand -hand combat. Secret moves. 
all this kind of awesome stuff. And then you start to get one year later, you get Mortal Kombat by Midway, uh, Tekken by Namco. Uh, but really what's happening is instead of playing against the machine, you could still do that, of course, right? You can go one player mode. But all of a sudden you could slap a quarter in that bad boy and your buddy can put him in his quarter and you can go head to head. And test your skills, right? Pick your guy with special moves and a backstory. And then bada bing, you can fight off your bro and see who's got the skills to pay the bills, yo. Right? So all of a sudden, it's like watching a boxing match. That's why I like to think of these fighting games as boxing matches, right? And um, in fact, Street Fighter 2 spawned what would be considered the first esport, right? Still, the actually the fighting genre is kind of different than you know the rest of your um, massive multiplayer games or battle arena game style oh. styles. They're um, kind of separate uh, and have their own kind of culture. Then, thanks a lot, Mortal Kombat. In '94, we start to get video game hearings, right? The culture is coming to grips with kids and technology and violence, right? Because all of a sudden, uh, you, rap music, you know, comes out of the black culture and it's violent and it's aggressive, right? And then you have these uh, metal bands, right? Start to come out, which start to scare parents too, right? You know what KISS stands for? KISS stands for Knights and Satan's Service, right? <laughs> That's what my parents told me. Uh, so you, the culture is experiencing the satanic panic, right? All of a sudden there's secret cults hidden all over, you know, trying to take down the innocent youth of this country, Um and you can hear their evil messages uh, in rock music. You can get training on how to rip out someone's spine on these video games. Oh my god, what are we ever going to do? Well, we're going to put a rating on video games, <laughs> right? That's what happens. You know, uh, all of a sudden... You get these parental advisory labels that start to go on to CDs, right? I remember going and buying myself an MC Hammer CD uh, and getting myself a nice vanilla ice, right? And I had to take my parents with me because my parents were cool, yo, right? Uh, and let me buy because I couldn't get it because it had a parental advisory label. And you get the ESRB come out for video games, right? Um... And, uh, you know, in these hearings, they kind of take the video game industry to task for its violence and marketing children. Um, you know, more about Sega than anything, because actually in uh, the Sega version of Mortal Kombat, you could put in the secret blood code. And all of a sudden, the what looked like sweat, because they kind of made it transparent, would all of a sudden have blood flying everywhere. It was awesome. But... It also got them in hot water. So kind of a death nail in the, the coffin uh, of arcades too. Uh, and consoles are getting a lot better and more capable, almost as capable of arcade machines, right? Uh, 98, 99, you get Dance Dance Revolution and kind of pops back in. Uh, you know, ultimately it was killed off by the console, right? You can buy these machines that were eventually just as capable just as graphics heavy um you know maybe just a slight downgrade the games were almost as fun and exciting and intense as the arcade version at a fraction of the cost right i can plunk down 40 bucks get myself uh you know a used copy of mortal kombat versus you know going to the arcade and you know, now it's a, you know, it was a dollar play at that time or two quarters, depending on where you went. Um, and so the arcades start to die. You see, basically, instead of big arcades, 
Um, you know, you have like one or two at, uh, at a, um, bar, or maybe you'd see one or two at the laundry mat, but that was about it. Um, now arcades have made a slight comeback and nostalgia, right? People like my age, you know, 30, late thirties, early forties, they miss playing a video game. Uh, and they like drinking, right? So all of a sudden you get these bar arca barcades that become popular. Um, you do have like some really well-known um, like Galloping Ghost Arcade or Fun Spot, that kind of stuff that comes to exist. Um, the, those are kind of like mecca uh, experiences. But arcades die out, man. So, you know, take a minute, kind of think about what's your experience with arcades. Were they around? Did you see them? Um, you know, did you actually get to play with them? Probably what you experienced was a redemption system that's still super popular. Um, basically, you get tickets for playing. You take those tickets, you turn them in for, like, janky prizes and stuff like that. Um, that's because... That's something consoles can't do, right? Your Xbox or PlayStation can't shoot out tickets. If your Xbox or PlayStation is shooting out tickets, that means your little brother shoved the Chuck E. Cheese tickets in there and is destroying the darn thing and you're going to beat him, right? So hopefully your Xbox isn't shooting out tickets. But that's an experience that the consoles just cannot match. And that's really what arcades have to do to stay alive in any sort of way is figure out a method of uh, doing something councils can't.